Bolts Nation, welcome back to another amazing episode of the Bolts Block Party. I am your host, Greg Wolf, joined by my co-captain, Braden Coburn, and I could not be more excited, Kobe, for this gentleman to join us. I've been trying to get this guy on the show for the last You've like, been pushing two hard. seasons. You've been pushing really have, hard. And we finally got the Prince of Darkness, as he is referred to. Been with this guy for 17 seasons myself. John Franzone, our senior vice president of game presentation sits down with us here on the block party and John what an um, intro, huh? what, oh, you what know you got, intro, you gotta, we gotta give you your just <laughs> cell phones off <laughs> cell phones <laughs> off in the, in the studio so John listen uh, Kobe doesn't know and I'm sure our fans don't know the true backstory of how you got to this point with the Tampa Bay Lightning so I would love for you to go with us the journey starting from when you were an intern with the Mets back in 86 when we beat the Red Sox to NYU Film School, to working for Disney, the Rays, the Olympics, the Yankees, and eventually ending up here with the Lightning. I know that's a, a mouthful, but you've had a pretty amazing journey, and I would love for our fans, and Kobe as well, to hear about your journey of how you got here. So take us back to where it began, your love for sports, and, and yeah, how that I, all... I, honestly, before you even get to that, I, I would just love like a description of, kind of what, what you do around here at, at the current moment. I uh, I like to tell everybody we're responsible with it for everything that interrupts the game. Pretty much everything. is how we put it, <laughs> yeah. right? Like it's it's everything that you'll experience, with the exception of the on ice performance. So it's the lights, it's the sounds, it's the music, it's the videos, it's the graphics, it's the mascot doing his shtick, it's the PA announcer, it's the host, it's the kids outside, it's Greg Wolf, it's uh, the Blue Crew, it's it's just this amalgam of all these different ingredients, Kobe. That that somehow amplify the experience our goal at the end of the day win or lose on the ice is to have everybody go go home a little happier a little more informed a little bit more entertained than they were when they came in yep. and if we do that then that elevates that that ticket you have in your phone and it, it gives it a value proposition and that's that's our job mm -hmm. and our secondary job is to really just be glue glue for the fans to connect with their favorite team and their favorite players. That is all we focus on in terms of responsibility, decisions to be made in terms of even content like this. Mm -hmm. What's going to connect our fans to our players, to our team, and, and make that connection even stronger? So if you want to sort of, you know, bubble it, that's more or less where my focus is on a weekly, monthly, yearly it's literally the environment. Like he right. is the curator of vibes in the in the building. If, if you but it's to. not it's not me. You're no, too kind. Team, right? Orchestrator of kind. fun. Yeah, it, the maestro. Orchestra, the maestro. maestro is a good word because all that guy does is stand there and he keeps time. But it's the guys who play the instrument. T t cameraman Tyler, right. right back there. It's the guys who play the instruments, who do the editing, who do the shooting, who do the um, audio mixing, who do the stage managing, who do the script writing, all that stuff is one big team effort, just like a hockey mm -hmm. team on the ice and everybody's got to play their part. They have their specialties. And then there's times when they improvise. And then there's times when we make stuff up <laughs> you know right. that, yep. on the fly on the fly. or times you'll take a risk right. and hope it works. And if it's, if it's not going to work, at least at the end of the day, it's a calculated risk because that logo stands for something now more so than it did say 16 years sure. ago. Right? right. So we have to be very, careful in how we we craft our content craft our end game so that it measures up to that well what that logo stands for thank, thank you for framing that for me because sure. I, I really didn't know you know as a player's perspective you know our job is we come to the rink and you know and rightfully so the, the it's all crafted about all we're focused on is our performance on the ice right but there's just such a bigger picture the whole product and the whole this whole thing that is professional sports that you guys play such an integral part in that uh i guess it's just a huge part of it but thank you for covering that and and then what how did yeah let's like, take like, the, like, so, yeah, let's how did we get here yeah. how did we get here um, man go back to the beginning it's, little johnny franzo yeah little guy he wanted to be uh he wanted to be a steven spielberg Okay, so you Johnny wanted to direct movies? I went, yeah, I went to NYU Film School, and the goal was to write screenplays. So uh, my goal was to graduate NYU. Not the goal, but the plan. Right. Uh, because goals kind of come and go, right? Sure, like, of course. the plan was to go to L.A., write screenplays, and eat peanut butter sandwiches until, you know, one of them hit. So, so even, so. like, as a young age, you wanted to write? You yeah. You created yeah, writing I've always been a, I've always been a writer okay. in, the, in the sense of being able to make something out of a piece of paper, gotcha. right? And, right? And turn it into something, you know dramatic or, or funny or just a synopsis whatever it is I was I was good at writing okay. still. so drawn to the arts not necessarily the sports 
No, but I was a huge, huge, huge. We played sports all when we were kids back in the day. We used to play outside, right. you know, <laughs> like we we played hockey in the winter in the street and we played ball hockey. We played football in the fall. And we played baseball, little league, yep. high school, and all that. Once. I saw, you know, most of my friends start to eclipse me in growth. I pretty much gave up the high school sports dream and, and st started concentrating on what my other passion was, which was writing. So okay. the goal was to go to NYU, graduate, go to L.A., write screenplays, write teleplays. Okay. But, Kobe, I was a huge Mets fan. Okay. And it was just this time, 19, I'm going to date myself now, but 1983, they had just started putting in these monster diamond visions in stadiums. And at the time, they were just like, you know, they were just video boards. boards and right. all you really saw up there were fan, shout, yep. fan shots yep. and uh, replays. Yep. That was it. There wasn't necessarily all the content we do now, the stuff you're involved in in yep. terms of live contests and, um, and pre-produced features and such. Kiss cam. Yeah, none of that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> right. it, didn't, it didn't exist. Right. And it was only through that for those formative years where the teams that bought these big displays they bought the nascar but they didn't have the drivers gotcha so what they found the cheapest way out <laughs> was hiring kids just graduating college okay because you get them for a nickel yep and they'll work you know hours work and their hours butts off, right. um <clears throat> and um and start to bring this new technology to life so that's kind of where i was in the right place at the right time with the right interest and where was my first internship at the mets who was the biggest mets fan in the world me you were <laughs> what year was it? 1986. Mm. What year did they, they beat the Red, Red Sox? Sox? 1986. You know, Game 6 miracle and all that? 1986. So I'm thinking, this is great. I can make a video in the day, have 50,000 people watch it at night. Yep. And I'm going to the World Series every year. Awesome. But, <laughs> you know, then reality sinks in. Um, the next year I graduate, the Yankees are looking for, you know, inexpensive labor to handle this big monstrosity. I'll do it. Um <laughs> And it's only going to cost you a nickel. <laughs> right. Pretty much. <laughs> and, and I just took to it. I st started to fall in love with this sort of, like I said, this immediate means to create something because you're passionate about that team or that sport. And you share that with the fans. Okay. Right. Like we do. Of course. And then suddenly you're putting it out there in front of them. And lo and behold, you're getting applause. You're getting reaction. You didn't have to wait two weeks for your film to develop, right. you know, because back then that's all we had. Sure. Um, so, wow, this is really a cool little medium. So who hired you from the Yankees? Was it the top brass or was it uh, uh, management? Like no, because I had worked for the Mets, we needed Red Sox stuff to make all the graphics for the World Series. Oh. Who had yeah. it? The Yankees did. They were American League team. Right. So I just trudged my way over to the Bronx, and I said, who's running your screen? And she's like, well, nobody right now. I'm doing it. Oh. Like, she says, she she couldn't program a VCR. So. <laughs> uh, and was sorry, that hard? Bet. You sorry, you, bets. <laughs> you were um, saying you're a huge Mets fan. That must yeah. have been. Was that well, it was an adjustment. It definitely was an adjustment. But it, you know, God bless my my now wife, then girlfriend, who said you you're stupid if you don't take this job. Sure. Um, I think that's what she said. <laughs> well, you're still together. She, you can ask she her encouraged <laughs> me to do it. Let's leave it at that. And and um, I t I took the gig. It was part time at first, and they you know they liked the job I did. Uh, and it was a one-man band kind of thing. Sure. So you were the camera guy. You were the editor. You, you did everything. Um, and there was no budget. You just did whatever came to your head. Um, and it just sort of grew from there. Uh, and so how and long so was that for? How long did you Yankee, do that? I was with the Yankees for 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. And, and, you know, you work your way up the ladder. You make your mark. You start hiring more people. And... Um, you know, you start to build your staff, much like we, we did here. Sure. And uh, after 10 years at the Yankees, got my World Series ring 10 years later from the day I actually started with the Mets, right? Oh, wow. you, you're thinking you're going to get it every year. Right. But it doesn't, you know, you guys know it doesn't happen like nope. that. Um, and then after the, uh, after the Yanks, you know, you're late 20s, early 30s. Now you want to start a life, you want to start a family. So mm -hmm. my wife and I decided to uh, move to Florida, uh, spend a year at Disney, helping them um, – uh, get their sports complex off the ground. So the ESPN Wide World of Sports, Correct. you were a part of that. Yeah, the opening beginning. team. Yeah. And, and the thing was, why would you leave the Yankees except to go to Disney, right? Fair enough. But Disney, uh, it was very, it was different. The Yankees, more or less, like I said, it was a one-man band. It was my own world, like mom and pop shop. I could do more or less whatever I wanted with sure. this big ball of clay. Um, and on top of that, I worked for the Yankees when Seinfeld was 
parodying the Yankees right. with, with Costanza working at the front office. So <laughs> right. it was like an extra feather in my cap. Sure. And let's face it, that Yankee business card in New York City, mm. that was like printing your own money. Right. But I digress. But I digress. <laughs> oh. What about George Steinway? Obviously, he was he super controlling of everything that happened? He, uh, to be fair, um, in, in all seriousness, he was very complimentary of what I did. Um, and he saw we won a few quote, industry awards, and he was very, very complimentary of what I did. He liked the job we did once he, he came back from his exile uh, at the hands of Faye Vincent, I think it was. They, they, uh, they banned him from baseball for three years. But in 93, he came back, and the first thing he did was he wanted to see who was in charge of the game experience. Hmm. And it wasn't like it is now. Right. Uh, we didn't have a host. We had Bob Shepard at the microphone. Right. So it was a little different. Right. So what did I have to do to – Spice things up, We, m myself and my interns, we did the voiceovers. Mm -hmm. um, but it's funny you say that because that triggered that memory is, is Steinbrenner was very fair. He was nothing like the TV show. Mm. Um, uh, but he was, he was fair to me and my group, I would say that. But funny story, he, uh, you know, now you can see a replay as soon as it, um, as soon as it happens, right. right on your phone. Back then you didn't. And he would always sit on the far end of the press box. Okay. And we knew we had 23.2 seconds by the time he stood up walk the back of the press box to come into the control room you to better. look at a replay. Gotcha. So I would always bark at my replay guy, have it ready. He's going to come down here. Have it ready. Have it ready. You know, because that was life back then. He'd come in the room. Want to watch it? Hit play, and then he would leave. Wow. And you had to be ready. Yeah. That's don't, when it was like on know. tape. Like, this is like VHS so beta was, tapes. It was like Seinfeld. It just yeah. wasn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after. <clears throat> so Disney. Me. So yeah, after the Yankees, I went to Disney. Disney was great. Great experience. I learned more about customer service in, in one year at Disney, which is almost a necessity. For and sure. then, um, but it, it didn't have that home team sort of, you know, dynamic that we all share here. Like, we're all fighting for that logo. Right. Um, it was a little bit different. You know, they had AAU uh, hockey, uh, not hockey, uh, volleyball, basketball, football. Baseball, um, right. Fields, all that, that, yeah. Atlanta Braves trained there. The Globetrotters trained there. That was their world headquarters at the time. Um, in any event, it just it was just this hodgepodge of stuff, and I didn't I, I didn't jive to it. Mm. And then the Devil Rays were just starting up. Yep. And that I had known Rick Vaughn, who mm -hmm. was uh, VP with the Rays. Yep. And they were uh, looking for they needed help because they had they were coming up on opening day. There were four months, no control room, no staff, no crew. Um, no screens. I'll do it. Right. So, uh, <laughs> of you course. know, we, uh, we made that jump and then um, spent 10 years with the Devil Rays, mm -hmm. 10 bad years sure. on the field. Right. But, our, you know, we used that as a challenge to make our show as entertaining and as fun, to. As, as fun as possible. And we did. We treated every game like Game 7 um, so that, you know, the fans that were coming – uh, you know, got through those those rough years. Sure. So we like, you know, you don't get any awards for that. It's a feather in your cap. We won a few like industry awards there, but the, but the biggest takeaway was that we we created a an experience that at least if you were coming to see the Rays, you, you knew where you, you knew right. where you were going in October. You can make your October plans the day after opening day. <laughs> right. back then. Right. So, um, Different times. Yeah. yeah. And then after the after ten years at the Rays. I literally was packing things up in my office when we parted ways. And the first uh, text I got was from Sean Henry, who mm -hmm. was the CEO here at the time, and yep. Bill Wickett. Yep. And uh, they said, we've been a big admirer of your guys' work. Would you consider coming over here? Now, I told my wife, I said, we don't have to leave town. This right. is great. Uh, but it took a while because the team was going through that ownership change yep. from Palace Sports to Vinic, to, well, no, the to, Cowboys. to to Coolis and yeah. uh, and Barry, and it just took a while to get going. So it almost took um, maybe nine months from the time I was leaving my office to actually landing here till I got everything straightened out, and it was rough going. No, I yeah. trust it, me, I know. Here. I was it here was for rough it all. going. Um, you know, God bless mommy, daddy, and Mister Vinick. That's God. what I used to tell my kids. Amen. About because without Jeff coming in and and the management that has spearheaded the changes here yep. uh it, it we wouldn't have this right now today so and now 16 years here yeah did you have any reservations about moving from baseball which you knew very well to hockey and i know that you did a lot more here that i know arena football and different things like that sure but hockey was the main component yeah. of it right um yeah kobe we could have this conversation between pitches you know like that's that's the speed baseball goes 
and now suddenly you're going from this this sort of all right, w- wake me up when it's the bottom of the second <laughs> mindset, Fact. because now you're calling the game Consistent. and the game the game moves and it has ebbs and flows and momentum swings and you have to adjust your your game calling to it, and that was an education that took me maybe two or three months to just sort of grasp and I had always been a hockey fan I had worked freelance with the Islanders for a little bit Mm -hmm. and the Rangers when I was in New York Um, grew up an an Islanders fan as well back there in the heyday of the of the four cups right Um, but never worked it like calling it you know being the maestro so to speak in that respect so it was it was a learning curve for sure for sure so you come here to the lightning obviously the the vision if you will uh obviously we have what we call lightning vision but the vision as a whole mr vinnick he brings in todd Lewicki, hires steve griggs and like you said some of us were ousted by the previous regime but those guys really focused i felt on the fan experience and what the fans were saying and that's where todd Lewicki came in wanted to see season ticket member feedback from the previous regime and they were like, where's Greg Wolf? What happened to this? And so the fact that they listened to the fans and said, this is what our fans are asking about. This is what they want. This is what we need. Brought me back, which again was amazing for that to happen. But the vision of the organization obviously starts with Mr. Vinnick. And the transformation that we've seen from the Lightning Vision product over the years, the shift, there's been, a, there's been an absolute shift in the game night experience, but that has been an evolution of sports. And I feel like You've had such an integral part of that, the full sensory experience, a casserole of entertainment, as you've been quoted as <laughs> yeah. saying in the past. One but, of the worst quotes ever. <laughs> I mean, they loved it on uh, Fox 13 when you yeah. said it, but that's a great uh, a representation of what it is. But when did you feel that that shift really changed? Because it wasn't right at the beginning. I feel like over the years, our product has dramatically increased as far as the experience. And where did that all kind of curate and begin? Well, I kind of alluded to it earlier. You know, I said that logo, it's got to stand for something. Sure. And I'm going to go back in time a little bit, but but I was here. I was part of that window of time where I came here in 2008. Jeff and, and, and Todd and Steve mm-hmm. didn't come along until 2010. Right. They could have said, you know what, we'll, we'll go another direction. Right. Thanks for your time. But they didn't. And I don't know if it's because they saw something or had, had – you know, knowing that I had been in the industry a little for a little bit of time, mm-hmm. but they gave me the benefit of the doubt, and I'll always be thankful for that. And it was something that that I take a step back. You you're never too old to learn something. Absolutely. And here you are. You've worked twenty years in this business. You you're known throughout your stupid little industry as a veteran. Yet I'm coming into this this new regime and you're like all right where do we fit Mm -hmm. and I remember sitting with Todd and Steve and Todd says I'll tell you one thing game presentation is the ultimate manifestation of your brand and in one sentence it encapsulized everything that I sound like a light bulb went off Mm -hmm. uh, of everything we need to be mindful of and and adherent to to produce a game presentation a show it's an extension of that it doesn't exist no one's buying a ticket to come see your show right they expect they might expect one but it's not it's not their fundamental um purpose in coming to the game they want to see a hockey game but Mm -hmm. you're there to enhance it so suddenly all these things start trickling in so now anything where it's like plastered sponsor that's got to that's gotta fit now mm-hmm. in your world. I always draw this triangle, like sp- fans, sponsors, team. Draw that triangle. So if, if an idea comes to us, it's got to fit in that triangle sure. so that it hits all those marks. It's not going to exist. You know, there was a time this place was peppered with nothing but sponsor ads, right? right. It looked like a subway tunnel. <laughs> <It did. laughs> it's like sponsor right. ads everywhere. And now it's, it's, there's no mistaking that this is a lightning product, sure. that this is a lightning show. Um, that it's representative of Jeff Finnick and company and Steve and all the great uh, people we have here. So that that one sentence that Todd put out there suddenly framed everything that we needed to be mindful of. And now we've been able to impart that onto a whole new generation of, of kids on our crew. Mm-hmm. You've seen them grow. You've yep. seen them come up. People like Tyler behind the camera there. Um, you, they now have adopted that and they're protective of it, right? Like they want to they want to make sure that nothing's going to threaten it. And at the same time, let's keep pushing. Sure. 
and and create new content like Bolt's Beginnings, like Recharge, Recharge like this, and, and, and thunder. keep growing, yeah. keep growing that connective tissue, right? That that our fans want to gravitate. So to. how do you? How, so where are you finding the Tyler? I know I'm rambling. No, I mean like, how do you assemble such an award winning team, right? Where have you find like we obviously have the best of the best in the industry. Guys have won Emmys, Gabe and Mikey, but like. Where are you finding the talent? Because we've assembled really what is looked at upon the sports and entertainment industry. There's a reason why MLB teams are visiting us and NFL teams and, and NBA teams are coming here to see our product and see the staff and what we've done. But where are you finding these individuals? Uh, it's, it's a lot of it is luck. A lot of it is timing. Um, Gabe, for example, he ro rolled in here at a job fair. And, oh, wow. and Kelly and Kelly Yelishin, yep. who was my s number two at the time, she, right. she came... She was working the job. She said to us, you, you should look at this kid. Uh, I, think, I think fundamentally when you work interior to a hockey team or any sports team, you, you, I always say this to kids who come to, to interview for us. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I like to see if that little spark is there. And if that spark is there, that kid gets it. We always say in the line, that kid gets it. Sure. He gets it. Uh, because you know you're going to work nights. You know you're going to work weekends. You know you're going to sacrifice family yep. time. You know you're going to be underpaid. <laughs> right. I um, mean, it's just the facts. It's, you know, if, if, if you can see that that subtext is being grasped and, and all they really, you know, fundamentally is most important to them is creating really good stuff mm -hmm. and then ultimately playing it out for our fans to enjoy or, or putting it on a channel for them to enjoy, then, like, it's like one plus one equals three. Sure. Right? And... And the good ones stay. The good ones have had opportunities to go elsewhere, but they stick around. Um, and and then they become. Then there's a loyalty that that's that's un underneath that. Mm -hmm. Then there's like I said, protectiveness of the brand. Is that such a word, protectiveness. Yes, I like to now. say I'm a writer, right? <laughs> uh, but you get where I'm going. Yes, like there's, facts. There's there's that that sort of fierce defense of that logo now and yeah. everything it stands for, which is even more important. So. John, I wanted to ask you, so Tampa traditional non-hockey market, right? Mm -hmm. And you play an important role. And, and I just, I wanted to understand the progression, I guess, since you've been here about your job as kind of an educator of the game. You know, you're, yeah. you're entertaining, but you're also, you're to a certain level of fan, you're educating them about the game as well. And I kind of wanted to ask about the balancing act of, and how maybe that's changed since the early days to the fans that we have now. A little bit. You, it was funny, Kobe. I got here in Florida '96 and '97. Sorry, and I had come to a couple games when I was over at Disney, and it was it was lean years here. Right. It was yeah. it was an empty building. Yeah, it wasn't and great. I think Vinny had just gotten drafted, and and I'm like, wow, that's okay. Right. <laughs> um, and but when I when I moved to Tampa Bay. And I had, from across the bay, working for the race, I had seen the team start to, you know, Trickling start to yeah. become Elevate. better yep. year after year, pickup after pickup, until finally in 04, you know, they win it all. And I remember sitting, I was, I was holding my boy, I was watching the game seven in my bedroom, just kind of rocking him to sleep, and there's the boys holding up the cup, and I'm thinking, this is really cool for this area. But I remember being around it, it was a part, it was like a party. Mm -hmm. It was almost like Mardi Gras. Right. It wasn't as necessarily – there's that segment of fans that really know the game. And then there's that segment of fans that get swept along by the hysteria of a Stanley Cup run that are learn the game. We've been fortunate in two ways. So we sort of had that first generation who are still coming to games. Yes, they are. That second generation who learned through that first experience. And now we've sort of shepherded the last, I don't know, 12 years, 13 years mm -hmm. of kids who maybe might have been six or seven – and you see them all the time when you work with them in the, in the youth, youth hockey. hockey. Um, and now that they know the game. Um, so when I first got here, it was about sort of reteaching. A lot of our in-game features and elements were, were on lightning history and, and um, teaching fundamentals of the game. We did a Hockey 101 segment with Dave Anderchuk yep. in bold yep. to a live audience. On, on Many times we did that. Over and over and over. We did a live version of it, actually, that was aired on, on Valley Sports. Um, but now we've sort of shifted the paradigm just a little bit right of center so that we're having, you know, a little bit more sort of fun content, more interactive content, host-driven content, um, because now it's more – you have a foundation now what that game yeah. – um, 
does and means so you know fans know how to react on an icing they know what an icing means right. they're coming to the game already right. they're, prepared. they're sort of prepared yeah. and and let's face it the, the the runs we've had have also done that out of this building right as well so like now you're now you're inheriting a fan that that's sort of armed for battle as we you know i like to say obviously we know we are such a um heavy military community and we know the importance of the military for our city but the fact that the the lightning and the military have have meshed together um the medal of honor night which i i want to say was probably the ultimate highlight of your professional career but talk to us again about how you've been able to help curate that relationship between the military community and the team because i feel like out of all the sports whether it's nba nfl mlb i feel like our team here by far does the most for the military showcasing our military um, but just really entrenching ourselves with that community. I feel like you have a, ma- a major part of that. Well, it, you have a lot of it's, help, it's, but it's like, yeah, it's easy to take <laughs> Mark you know, to and give I, me right. credit for that, but you don't do it first and foremost without the permission to do it. Sure. So the trust that Steve and our management puts in me to execute that, or at least guide it. Sure. Is great. Um, and then you have to have the resources to be able to invite these people to the game or, or showcase them in a different way. But fundamentally, the military has always, always had, I've always had a soft spot for the military. My dad served in the Navy. Um, I never served. And in, in the back of my head, maybe there's always a little bit of guilt for never serving. Um, I grew up in a, in a, in a military family in, in that my two uncles served remember my uncle was in Vietnam. He said, I had bullets flying over my head when I found out you were born. Oh uh, my right? Stuff like that. Wow. So it resonated with me. And sure. then when I, when I came to a couple games here while I was working for the Rays and I was watching the, the, what was happening, there was a military presentation going on. And Paul Porter, God bless his heart, it's time for our military salute. And he's reading the guy's bio. Mm-hmm. And now people are standing and applauding. And he's still reading. Mm-hmm. And he's still reading. And he's still reading. And he's still reading. I'm like, that's not the way to do this. We need to honor these people um, a little bit more respectfully sure. so that there's there's this swell that builds to the payoff at the end like we like we, We've we done do now. now. Right. We don't say a word no. during, that, graphic, during that right. feature, right? But I always know. say it's time for our standing salute, and that's it. it. But So now you're investing your fans in, in absorbing these short little bios. You're introducing a stranger to 20,000 people in 45 seconds. Right. So... Um, <clears throat> so it's that tact that has allowed us to sort of create what you like to say is like a model of, of how we do it. Yeah. But it doesn't happen without the trust and the, the, the green lights to say, go ahead and do it because it's, it's the right thing to do because we are a military town. 100%. So we take great pride in that. Um, and like you said, the Medal of Honor night was, was beyond it's amazing. Unbelievable. That yeah. night. 40 se- 46 it. of the living 70 Medal of Honor recipients amazing. on our ice. Amazing. Like, it's just never happened before, correct? I mean, as and, far and as it'll never got. happen again. Right. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It was so on, we were on NBC that night, and, and Jeremy Rennick was, was commentating. He was on the ice, and he had he, tears were in his eyes. Yeah. It was remarkable. It was, it was, it was pretty a, cool I mean, from a player's still, perspective, yeah. and those guys, and, and they, they spent some time with us in the dressing room, and the, and the the event we had over across the street at the hotel, yeah. um, really cool. But, you know, you guys have to take chances sometimes. And you guys make chances, and sometimes they work out spectacularly. And sometimes there's major swings and misses. And I guess as a casual, you know, you guys know that where the bodies are buried. I kind of <laughs> want to know what are some major swings and misses that have happened. Oh, man. man. What's the biggest oh sh- moment we've, that's happened? We've had a few of them, huh? We've had. I mean, um, I tried to block them out, I'm sure. There was, yeah, there's one, Kobe, and I'm not shy about saying it. We had a uh, we had a, a Jewish Heritage Night here in 2010, and uh, we were supposed to give a gentleman the microphone for 30 seconds, and it turned into three minutes. <laughs> and you know as well as I, you're on the clock in hockey. Yes. And it was just, where is he going with this? And, oh. and you want to be respectful. Sure. You don't want to take the microphone away, but... <laughs> He kept going and and I'm thinking we're gonna miss we're gonna we're gonna get fined here like you know so <laughs> that was one of them. Um, so many have gone. So many things have gone wrong. It's almost like you just well, put them in your okay, back. Okay, I'll pocket. give you a perfect example. Uh, la- was it last two weeks? Two weeks ago, our entire audio system went down. No, no, the, no, no. We had a, a wireless network okay. failure in Th- the building. This happened literally two weeks ago, yeah. where there was a wireless network in the building which affected 
everything in the game production. Anything element. that's set on a wireless platform. Right. So our His sound, our audio, my microphone. So everything. I, yeah. So what do you do in those situations? Because so, the show must go on. Right. And, and to be fair, I was in my office. Steven is producing. Steven Fry and yep. Felicia Sablon is directing in yep. the control room. And they amazingly guided you guys through that nightmare <laughs> with the help of Pete, uh, Pete and, and Calvin and Kian, and Kian and, on yep. audio that the fans never knew. Never knew. But just to give you an example of what happened that night. So all the comms go down, like the audio goes down. Again, <laughs> you still have a show to run. Like the video boards, they were like stuck on certain graphics. And I'm literally staying up at 218, which is our perch. And Paul Porter has the only working microphone in the building. Because it's cable. Because it's cable, <laughs> right, plugged in directly to the house. So I was not able to really leave my perch. And when Paul would finish his announcement, I would literally, we'd have an XLR cord, and they would run the microphone over yeah. to me so that I could actually do my breaks. Yeah. But again, on the surface, fans really had no idea. But behind the scenes, it's a yeah. it was chaotic. Credit to all those guys, Stephen Felicia and company, for, yeah. for, for pulling that off. And they did it without... <laughs> you would really never know on the surface. Yeah, they did it without panic. They right. did it calmly. They did it because they're still playing. Right. That right. break's coming. So You, you know. have to figure it out. But at the out. end of the day, though, when I first got here, we had to be so attentive to nailing everything. We were looking for that perfect dismount every time. Right. I thought I was producing Apollo, you know, trying to bring Apollo 13 back <laughs> every game. Yeah. And it, it, the stress level on that is just too much to put on yourself. And, and over time, maybe it's because I've gotten older and we've gotten more help and a bigger crew and a trusted crew that you could sort of step back, hand the reins to the kids and just watch them go and just be a rudder for them. So now I'm not nearly as, as stressed. Like on a night like that, right. in the old days, my head probably stressed. would have exploded. <laughs> yeah, of course. But the only thing I did that night was I ran to the light board because That's our right. new lighting system is on a wireless platform. Right. Um, was on sorry a network platform so I didn't know if that issue was going to affect the game lighting I didn't want to have happen yeah, like yeah. in Philly two weeks ago three weeks ago yeah so that's where I that's my first instinct was to just go to the light board um, it was crazy so Wolfie you brought up Paul Porter mm -hmm. and I was I was asked to, to to bring this up and you know every once in a while he's not able to make the game and Paul Porter he's the in game uh, PA announcer for he the announces Magic the goals for the Orlando Magic right and there's well. a yeah. conflict right every once in a while so there's guys that fill in. And I was talking to Pat Donovan on the radio show this morning, oh, and he was telling me about the time Pat. he filled in and some mistakes. And he is like, he has PTSD from the mistake oh, uh, he made on the PA announcement. Yeah. And I know there's been other guys. I remember being here and hearing goals announced, guys' names wrong. He announced a killer's name or killer's number to yeah, Cooch's goal. Cooch's goal yeah. you know. well, God bless you, Pat. We know you meant well. <laughs> we and, love you, bro. And we love you, man. <laughs> Um, but, 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 you know, that's, it's, it's funny because you could sit behind a microphone and, and, and think you can go, but in the moment, like there's, there's a lot of pressure, you know, uh, even Paul, he'll, he'll make a, a bomb every now and then, um, it happens. it happens. And, and even Bob Shepard, like one, <laughs> the venerable Bob Shepard at Yankee stadium, he had a switch on his microphone and this is when the Yankees weren't very good when I, when I got there and we're getting shelled. The relief pitcher comes in and he's just he forgot his mic was open. Oh, no. And this is what you hear at Yankee Stadium. You call that relief pitching? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you, it happens. Right. Um, and and it's it's worse when a sub comes in because there's, you know, they're coming in to Fill hold in, the right, fort, right. right? You know, much like a, a backup goalie, like just sure. hold the fort. And, uh, you know, when when that happens, sometimes you just, you know. I love it. Your butt tightens up and you go, oh, no. <laughs> the old butt <laughs> tighten yeah. up. Uh, so I, I got to ask, because uh, a couple weeks ago, I went to the Savannah Bananas, mm -hmm. right? And me and my family, we had an amazing time. And I'm just curious, is, you know, the product they put there, is that where we are going as far as, like, professional sports, that type of interactive experience that, that the team I, and the I, fans I hesitate have? to say yeah, only because... And I don't mean this in a bad way, but there's there's kind of like a one-upsmanship. And it happens on every level in sports production. Hey, who guess who has ice projection? Hey, do you see mm -hmm. who put lights in their ice stanchions? Mm -hmm. That's cool. Hey, they've got Tesla coils in Tampa Bay. Like there's there's just that sort of keeping up with the Joneses on a tech technical right. side. Then there's the show side, right? So if some team does something edgy, like the Dallas Stars, they're very edgy. And they have a license to be. Their management tells them just 
Push the envelope. Ruffle, ruffle right. feathers. Right. But that that's not who we are. Right. right. You know, we're not a pie in your face team. Right. I'd like to be sometimes. Sure. But we're not. So, you know, we try to maintain. But like you said, you, you guys have an identity here, right? Right. You have so, an identity. But some teams are, are willing to push that envelope to the point where, you know, they might get their wrist slapped or, or showcase in a bad light. You've seen it every now and then on yep. social media where, where they, they make a poor choice and right. it's, it's out there now. Right. Um, whereas back in the day, you can make a poor choice and it was pretty much buried that night before, right. before the stupid um, instant, uh, right. you know, everybody's suddenly a reporter. On their phone, right. But in any event, I think, I think it is. Kobe, the, the, guy, um, the founder of the team, he wrote a book called Fans First. I haven't read it yet. Stephen actually gave me the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's on my to-do list to read that book because I want to gain a little bit of the insight as to, as to the why. We know what the what is. They're, they're going, they're running around doing yeah. home runs and doing right. backflips and Pitchers everything. Pitchers on like stilts. That. I mean, right. it's, it's just. Well, what's the why? Right. You know, where, where is it? Is it because you're dissatisfied with the where game, the game right. presentation, traditional presentation of professional sports? Or is it, it because you realize there's this one niche that, that you can, you know, open up a whole new set I of kind rules of put it right. for. In the same category as the Globe Jotters, uh, as, you know, arena football. It's more a novelty sport. It's a novelty event. It's a family driven, you know, uh, situation where, again, it's to generate revenue. It's non traditional, right? That's what we call that. Right. But don't be surprised, though, if one of our people go to a game, right. a bananas event, and they say, hey, you know what they did? You know, we always say, um, we go to this this conference called the Idea Conference. Which are, are you a Hall of Fame member for that? Uh, well, I don't want to break, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, know what that means. Yeah, I just yeah, know you they, are. We have a Hall of Fame for ideas. It's you the, know what Idea is? It's called Information Display and Entertainment Association. Right. It's a massive convention, or as we like to call it, the Nerd Fest. Okay, but so that's, 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 what, that's what I was going to say. I got, I, re- I got written down here. Nerd fest. Nerd fest. Nerd podcast with a bunch of nerds. But, so there we go. But uh, back in the day, I was, I was as as more and more colleges and pro teams got all this technology. I, I was lucky enough to be president of the group as it as it's grown. Now it's six, seven, eight hundred people strong mm-hmm. every year. They come to this annual conference, and our fundamental goal in sending our crew is to just steal ideas. Sure. And lightning eyes them. We it's in our business plan. Lightning eyes. A great idea in Dallas may work in Dallas, but it won't work here or right. in Vegas or in Washington, wherever, unless you tailor it for for your your fans and your game and your style and your brand. And it's funny. In New York with the Yankees, it, they still run it today. The, the Great City Subway Race. Okay. Which I just came up with only because I stole the idea from Milwaukee, who was doing the sausage race. Gotcha. Right, right. But sausage race wouldn't play in New York. What no. do we have in Yankee Stadium? Well, we have a complement of three t- three subway trains. Oh, cool. Well, wait, we could do an animated race. Like you know, you brainstorm that way, and you you tailor the idea to your team. So I, you know, that long way of answering your question. I wouldn't be surprised if bananas style hijinks right. finds its way to pro teams in some capacity. What um, about the players though? Like, how happy does it make you? Does it make you when a players want to be engaged? Like I'm thinking a guy like Alex Klorn, who liked to put out a lot of content. Yes. He, yeah. he was almost like a partner with you guys, you know, and then obviously some other guys are very, very focused on just focusing on the game. So yeah. is that very important to you to have players that are willing to kind of Absolutely. share that, that Especially partnership? Now. Yeah. hundred um, percent. And kill is a great example. Sergey's a pretty good example mm-hmm. too. He's very, he's, he's very engaged. engaged, but that's a progression. You know, there was a time, here, almost dovetailing when, when you got traded here uh, in, what was it, 14? 15, 15. Yeah. Um, we were making that transition. Our, there was a time our cameras were not even allowed in the hallway, much less the locker room post-game or pre-game or anywhere in between. Now we're documenting these guys with recharge, um, all access all the time. Both it's beginnings, in, in right. In seven or eight years, we made a seismic shift in that regard, and the players have a huge, huge stake in it. All our, all our uh, content online that's, that really resonates with fans is our players doing the goofy face-off, you know, right. the one-on-one thing. Yes. Or the mic'd up pieces where, the, you know, where they wear the mic on the ice and, and we're capturing what game, bring the fans closer to game night. Um, so all their interactions with us now over the last, I don't know, eight, nine, ten years, dovetailing with the proliferation of channels via social media right. and other right. outlets – has given them a bit of a platform, um, has given us a platform to help tell their stories. Yep. 
Um, and guys want to put it out there too, I think. Right. I think well, the minds are different. They really do, right? right? Like, I think when I first came to the league, guys were very concerned about, hey, this is my privacy. I don't want to put too much out there about myself. Yeah. Now I feel like guys are really willing to kind of put themselves out there, tell them what they're interested in, what their causes are, sure. how they feel about certain issues. I think that's part and parcel of how kids grow up now. They grow up with this right. in their back pocket. They love sharing. Right. And it's, it's that culture now. So it's it's almost like not even a forethought to, to come and, and, and do that if you're, like, say, coming from Syracuse and you're right. 20 years old, right? right? Whereas back in the day, like – when I was at the Yankees, you didn't cross that threshold no. in, the, in the locker room ever. Mm -hmm. You know, same here. Um, when I first got here, like, I, I remember Torch was the coach mm -hmm. that summer, and I was asking Bill when prior to coming here just to get the rules straight, you know, what's the boundaries, and don't go a, down there. Yep. Right? <laughs> yep. um, There's a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and you've had people grow with that, too, like Coop has grown with it, mm -hmm. and now he's as – accessible as, as anyone else and in a great way too. Well, so. I think the block party obviously has a lot to do with that. Well, as well. I, we're giving them a well, perfect platform. example, but, right. but it's great for us because right. when we have guys that we might not necessarily know that are coming from Syracuse, like the first thing that we do is we go on their socials right. we check out, Hey, what's this guy interested in? What, what's he? And then we kind of are able to craft our questions off that. Right. And just yeah. get a little, little bit of uh, insider on what this guy's all about. You know, this is funny because there was a time when we would do our, quote, tribute videos that we do in-game, yes. you know, for players that have come back that have helped us win the, the odd cup or two. And it's not – it's just as much a moving piece because we've, we're, we're putting in pictures of them off the ice. Right. What they do either in the community or, or in their own family and as much as their highlights. Sure. So, you know, when you saw Killer's tribute or Patty Maroon's tribute mm – -hmm. Or Bogo's tribute. Mm -hmm. I'm just what sure. we did this year. Yeah. Or Colton even. Mm -hmm. um, you you saw them as the full person. Right. That's how we presented it. Not and the guys did an amazing job editing those pieces. They're always great. Uh, but you're seeing the whole person. Right. And the impact they've made here. Not just hey these are these That's are the, the on ice. Right. 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 Which I think is so. Great. And that I think is kind of reverse engineering back to your question, which is is like that that side of themselves is now. Uh, I don't want to say for us to cherry pick. That's rude. It would be more so that we can incorporate, right. you know, with their permission into everything else we do. Well, before we uh, get into our fact or fiction segment uh, powered uh, by our friends part at of the show, Lie, IPA, uh, what's the best advice that you were ever given? And I know you have several mantras that you use. One has always stuck with me, and that is luck favors the prepared. And that one for, forever has <laughs> stuck with me because if you think about it, that's absolutely true. If you are prepared for any situation that comes your way, if as long as you're prepared, things go left, luck is going to favor those that are prepared. Yeah, That's one I mean, that has stuck with me. Sure. But what's the best advice you've been given over the it's, years? It's kind of twofold. Uh, so I've, had a, I've, I've been lucky enough to have a number of mentors. I mentioned a few of them here today. Rick Vaughn, for one. Um, Bill Wickett, mm -hmm. for another. George Costanza. Uh, George, <laughs> George Costanza. Um, is Costanza, you know, <laughs> there's, 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 this, there's one episode where he's, he walks around the office just pretending to be angry all the time and mad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's working really hard. He's a keeper. <laughs> right. So that was my tactic for, for one year. But I, th I think um, it, it's kind of twofold. That's, that's one. The other is one fan is every fan. Okay. Which I learned in my days with the Rays. Okay. Because sometimes you only had one fan there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nothing against the Rays. They're a hell no, of a team great. now, folks. Go see them. Um, let's see us first. Uh, the other is, um, and I have it plastered in my office, and it's it's make a memory. Make a memory. That's We don't necessarily have an ROI on our salaries or all the equipment we invest in. Yeah, if the show gets sponsored. Thank you, Hyla. But um, we generally don't generate a, a very tangible ROI. Right. Fair enough. It's intangible. It's we make memories. It's the memory you take with you. So that has always stuck with me. Like never, never forget that we get this one opportunity 42 times a year, maybe 60 if we're lucky um, to make craft a memory in any capacity. It could be just a little kid waving on the screen. It could right. be a birthday message that goes up. It could be a military surprise reunion, which we've had the privilege of being Amazing. part of sometimes um, that. <clears throat> excuse me. That is kind of that keeps you grounded. Yep, it keeps you humble mm -hmm. um, because nobody makes more mistakes than I do. So you have to just remember what your greater purpose is. Love it. All right, so. 
We've kept you here long enough. That was fantastic. All right. You can talk all day about it. It is time for Nobody really cares outside of this room, right? No, they do. Absolutely, they kid. Uh, Fact or fiction presented by our friends at Highlight IPA. John, these are either true or false statements. So just take them as you will. All right. First one. Here we go. (laughs) The 2021 Stanley Cup celebration at Julian B. Lane Park was the most stressful and terrifying experience of your professional career. Fact or fiction? Stressful Both. and terrifying. So it's a fact Both. and a fiction? Yes. I was there with you. The fiction is Randorf. the fiction we'll is there was no twenty one celebration. No, <laughs> because it was kind of No, there was none. <laughs> We didn't even get off the launching pad. Remember, like in those movies where the rocket goes. Psh, yes. Psh, yes. That's yeah. That and then for those that remember. Oh my God! The it was the boat rain. parade was great. Blue skies, lovely Toy Story clouds, the whole bit. And then on the horizon, there's a wall of gray, and it's getting <laughs> blacker by the minute, and, and it's coming this way. It was literally like a, like a, a movie, wall. a wall, and a we wall. could see it coming. And um, destruction. The players, purge. the purge. <laughs> yeah. It was literally like the purge. Yeah, the players had just gotten to the boat center, and this wall of rain just slammed into everything that took three days for us to build up down there. The stage, the lights, the Scrims. the audio, um, destroyed. Just a total washout. Destroyed. Total washout. I was scared for my life. I'm not even gonna lie, because Dave Randorf and I got stuck uh, <laughs> up by the stage area yeah. by the control tent, the the control where they have like all the equipment and. We were literally stuck in this one spot, and the tent above us buckled. So now there's all this water just like like literally rushing into um, plugs and electrical equipment. Was, and I'm literally disaster. like, are we going to get electrocuted? And Dave and I were like literally scared for our lives. It was literally I, the most terrifying. I was under video. a blue tarp <laughs> at, at the production stage like this, and it was either light blue yes. because the lightning was flashing or dark blue because the, the lightning had stopped. And I remember th- I'm, I'm on the intercom before it crashes out. It was almost like, yep. oh, oh man, it was crazy. scary. So fact. Tell, tell my wife I love her. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. All right, I got one. All right, fact or fiction? Fact or fiction? Your Hollywood dreams have not died because you've been asked multiple times to be a stunt double for <laughs> Eugene Levy. <laughs> <laughs> that is beyond true. <laughs> Yeah, you push your eyebrows, but I mean, yeah. I told him many a times, dude. He reminds me of Eugene. Lee. Yeah, I, I get that over, and I get it from drive tr- drive through ladies sometimes. <laughs> like, Anyone ever tell you look like the daddy in American Pie? Yeah, yeah, I get that a lot. Um, and hey, if I had his bank account, I would not. You know, he's a very funny man. Have let's, you ever met him? No, but I would love to because okay. I I watched his career back when he was on SCTV, SNL, right, and all that like before SCTV. that. SCTV. Okay. And he was hilarious. Yeah. I always thought he was hilarious. He still is. Like yeah. Shit's Creek is, can I say that? Yes, you can. It's is, a TV show. Uh, it's a TV show <laughs> is, uh, is a great show. Okay. Fact or fiction, John Franzone, you were once an intern for the NBC Today show. That is a fact. Was that before or after the Mets? That was during. Oh, wait. Yeah. How's that work? Two internships? I had three. Oh, wow. What was the yeah. third? Uh, NYU television. So you're doing NYU TV. Yeah. I was going on two hours of sleep a night my senior year. That's what it takes, though. Sometimes. That's what it takes, kids. kids. Work hard. You'll get here someday. So how long did that internship uh, last? That was a s- eight-month internship. Okay. And I had to be at Rock Center at 3.30 in the morning. And then I would finish that shift at 9, go to class, finish that shift, do a little NYU TV stuff, and then go to Shea Stadium for the Good Mets Lord. game that night. It was, it, was a, it was a semester from hell. But... Look I don't do th- I don't do that. Those those few doors that did open up for me never happened. Mm. So yeah, true. Okay, fact, fact or fiction? Oh, you with this one more. You only use blue mechanical pencils for work. <sighs> that is true. <laughs> that is a true. fact. Okay. Well, thank you to your staff for helping me out with some. No, of that is why blue mechanical because that like a tick it's good luck. You know, guys have their mm. superstitions in the locker room. You know, so. so Fact or fiction? I've been in your office before. Um, you have <laughs> a you lot. Survived. You have a lot of stuff in there. A lot. Yes, he does. But the Stanley Cup rings are the item that you have in your office that you hold most dear. Um, mm. that's another. I'm gonna say fiction. That's a that's a both. I'm gonna I'm gonna say fiction just because I feel like the military stuff that he's been gifted, whether those are the coins or the things that those might hold. Well, that's where, that's where I'm going. Okay. As a symbol, Kobe, they are indicative of how lucky we've been to hitch our wagons to those great rides, right? I mean, it's all about the players. It's all about the locker room. And then by extension, everybody else who contributes, team sure. team behind the team. So those rings stand for something there, and they always will. However, they are 
um, what do you call them? Fabrications. Um, They're uh, replicas. Replicas. Yeah, the real ones. There I am, the up. great writer again. <laughs> Can't think of the word replica. Um, but they're replicas. The, the coins, to your point, yes. are all were all handed to me with a handshake from a military guy or gal Correct. who was very appreciative of what we did. So those coins mean the world to me. Yep, I'm there with yeah. them because I've gotten a few myself. So and it's f- kind of both. Yeah, all right. twofold. And finally, fact or fiction, John Franzo. Uh-oh. Producing Tampa Bay Storm games were some of the most fun in your career because of the anything goes mentality. How do I say this? That reaction says How do I say this? Storm, Kobe, you never had the privilege. <laughs> I never, never, I never, never did. Ever. Arena football was a party in search of a football game. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was remarkable. There were some things though that it was like a petri dish. Yes. We could do whatever we wanted. Yep. And we did to the extent that we were able to try different ideas out. So the face off, for example, yep. is a perfect example of what we took from a storm game, lightningized it, and now it's it's still a popular little feature today. But storm games were his face they up. were uh they were, they were something different. They were something. Do you mind if I get one last one? Sure, I please just, do. Give all us right. A bonus so, factor face. John, John Franzone, when you end the up DVD retiring, extras. when you hang up your skates and you call it a career, you are going to relive your screenwriting dreams, and you will be working on a piece about aliens from Saskatchewan <laughs> invading New York City. You're not far off because Ancient Aliens is probably my favorite television wow, show. Okay. I, that's pretty he good there. Um, Yeah, I find it hard to believe that the Almighty created this stupid planet as the only sign of intelligence in the universe. Look how stupid we are. Sure. Um, (laughs) But uh, that that is part of my hiatus uh, after I hang them up, so to speak. Yeah, I would love the opportunity, and, and, and... We've talked about it many times to maybe maybe teach some yes. of this stuff yes. at a collegiate level because no one is teaching game presentation, right? Really, and it, it's it's you know. Well, why not? Like I know <laughs> ten years ago, sports management yeah. wasn't a thing, right? Correct. So. They'll teach sports management, but but, not. but but the aspect of what game presentation brings, both as a revenue generator, as a as a a, a sort of symbol, living, breathing element of your brand, um, and as a means to teach kids how to run a camera, how to mix audio, how to write a script. It's not being done. It's not, it's not yeah. being done very much. And that's why. But there are schools like Auburn, FSU, and... Uh, USF has a Vinix Sports H- Husker Vision program. They, they do some of that. Well, but. I love the ring of Professor Wolf and Professor Franzone. Well, I, I think that's... Listen, uh, USF... You know, we get you guys little briefcases yes. and a little cardigan. You guys, you know, show up with your Tell combos. Robes. Yes, the robes. The robes. Nine. So USF, we're calling out to you, Michael Kelly... Uh-oh. Yeah, have law. He's putting it out putting there. Putting out there less Muma, John Franzone to create the VSG game presentation curriculum. Oh, I'll show up in the back. Well, I'll I'm be heckling you what? guys. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> professor Franzone. All right. Thank you, John, so much for yeah, taking the time and, and I was really us nervous. Why? I don't know. Even professionals get nervous See from that? time to time. There but you go. Amazing insight into the Prince of Darkness, as he is referred to, the maestro. Now, you know that name. I got to leave it. I have to get this out there. Okay, folks, please let us know. I can't. Prince of Darkness has a very negative connotation. It's a very Dracula-driven. It is, but there's a bigger meaning to it. It was actually a negative slam on me back in the day by the by the Bally Sports producers, then Fox Sports Net, because during rehearsals I would just indiscriminately turn the lights off. <laughs> Because I needed to do what I needed to get done. Sure. And this is part of your question earlier, like how do you matriculate from baseball into hockey where it's always daylight, right? right. Well, now I can turn the lights off. I took advantage of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it would, it would piss the guys off in the truck to no end, I'm yeah. sure, which is where that phrase was coined. It was I a slam it. on me. But, now, but because we can turn the lights off, especially during playoffs right. time, and bring some magic to life, for, you know, it's an for honor. the pregame. We'll take that honor. But yeah. we talk to the guys. We always want to know the nicknames, so it's good now to get know. The, we, now, now we know. Now you know the backstory of the Prince of Darkness. And now you yeah, know. Yeah, we turned a negative into a positive. Love it. So. John Franzone here with us on the Bolts Block Party. Thank you again to our friends at Highlight IPA for powering this shindig. And we will see you guys next week with a new episode. Holy mackerel. Did we really go 54 minutes? <laughs> we did. <laughs> yeah.